welcome to the week that was TIOL's weekly news roundup. Let's have a quick look at the major policy changes, legal and tax news coverage this week. The government has reached out to the Congress to get support for the passage of the long pending goods and services tax bill in the Rajya Sabha. The Congress is demanding clarification on the taxability of petroleum, alcohol, tobacco and electricity under the GST and asking whether GST would subsume the Swachh Bharat says as well. Will the government succeed in pushing the constitution amendment bill in Rajya Sabha in the monsoon session beginning July 18? We shall know by next week. The Enforcement Directorate has arrested Jagnesh Shah, the founder of Financial Technologies India, the company that promoted the National Spot Exchange, which was at the centre of the rupees 5,600 crore money laundering scam. Funds were allegedly siphoned off from the NSEL platform through bogus trades in the name of subsidiary companies. The ED is investing the money trail and has filed an application for Shah's custody for non-cooperation and on the basis of new evidences. Shah will remain in custody with the Enforcement Directorate until Monday. Even nepotism and prejudice are forms of corruption, which is not only rampant in the government but the private sector too. The Chief Vigilance Commissioner pointed out the need for a single code of ethics at the Conference on Corporate Ethics and Compliance, organized by the Confederation of Indian Industry. The Special Investigation Team has submitted its fifth report to the Apex Court on black money. In its report, it has noted that large amount of unaccounted wealth is stored and used in the form of cash. To curb the use of cash, it has called for putting an upper limit to cash transactions above rupees 3 lakhs and an act be framed to declare such transactions as illegal and punishable under the law, in addition to an upper limit of rupees 15 lakhs for cash holding. Kudos to the Companies Act. Indian companies were ranked as the most transparent in terms of financial disclosures, while Chinese organizations were found to be most opaque. The report by Transparency International covered 15 emerging market countries including Brazil, Mexico and Russia. And now let's move on to the news in detail. Is Narendra Modi India's most widely travelled Prime Minister? The Indian Prime Minister has joined the club of the most widely travelled country heads in recent times. As compared with other Prime Ministers during the first 25-month period of their tenure, while Manmohan Singh spent 64 days in foreign lands, Atul Bihari Vajpayee managed only 49 days. But Prime Minister Narendra Modi's latest tally is 24 foreign trips, covering 42 countries over 113 days. This is not counting the repeat visits to US, Nepal, France, Singapore, Russia, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. Such aggressive diplomacy may be just what India needs to shine internationally to boost foreign direct investment, develop bilateral relations, increase commercial cooperation and technical ties with the world. But one question, while focusing on India's neighbourhood and beyond, why has the Prime Minister not tried to heal the most troublesome spot, relations with our nearest neighbour with whom we share long borders and regular skirmishes? Is it a bureaucratic failure? What does the word Thulla really mean? The Delhi High Court has asked the Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal to explain the meaning of the word Thulla which he used against policemen. The judge observed that the word Thulla is not seen in any dictionary and if the CM has used this word, he must know the meaning. The court also exempted the Chief Minister from personal appearance before the trial court up to August 21st in a criminal defamation case filed against the Chief Minister by a constable. The constable Ajay Kumar Tanija had claimed that the Chief Minister used the derogatory word Thulla on a news channel to refer to a corrupt policeman. The word Thula is a derogatory colloquialism mostly used in Delhi to refer to a policeman engaging in wrongful practices. But hasn't it got the CM into trouble? Excise rules for the jewellers have been relaxed. Jewellers will welcome this news. 
the government has relaxed the excise rules for the jewellery sector by accepting the recommendations of the high-level committee which was appointed after jewellers nationwide went on a six-week strike. Under the new rules, the small-scale eligibility limit has been increased and smaller jewellers with a turnover up to Rs 15 crore will now be exempt from excise duty. For those with a higher turnover, excise duty will now be payable on jewellery at first sale invoice value. Repairs and alterations not being manufactured will not attract excise duty. Dwellers with a turnover of less than Rs 100 crore will not be audited for excise. An optional scheme may be prescribed for small dwellers who are not able to maintain separate physical stocks and records of manufactured and traded goods. The Aadhaar Act has been notified. Pending the Apex Court decision on whether Aadhaar card can be made mandatory for delivery of government benefits, the government has paved the way for the selection of the next chairperson of the Unique Identification Authority of India, a post lying vacant since two years. The government has notified the Aadhaar Target Delivery of Financial and Other Subsidies Benefit and Services Act 2016. It has also separately notified the rules for service conditions of chairperson and members UIDAI 2016, which will enable the selection of chairperson and members. The chairperson of UIDAI shall be now selected on the recommendation of a top-level committee headed by the cabinet secretary. New draft rules mandate licensing of medical devices. To regulate and streamline the quality standards of medical devices like pacemakers or blood pressure machines, the Health Ministry has released the new draft rules for public feedback. The rules provide that all unapproved medical devices being currently marketed in the country will need to be licensed within six months. Currently, only 15 categories of medical devices are licensed and regulated under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act. The rules propose quality standards for devices, including qualifications of the technical staff involved in production. The rules call for a division of the licensing and enforcement powers between the states and the centre, which may take on the responsibility for regulating the higher-risk devices. For the first time, quality inspection and audits of low-risk devices may be farmed out to third-party consultants for granting of licenses. The Health Ministry is also working on a separate Medical Devices Regulation Act. December 31st is the deadline for the one-time settlement of tax disputes. The government has set December 31st as the final deadline for multinationals like Vodafone and Kane to opt for the one-time settlement of tax disputes following the retrospective amendments to the Income Tax Act that left the government embarrassed. The dispute resolution scheme that opened on June 1st offered the multinationals a one-time settlement of tax demand with waiver of interest and penalty in return for withdrawal of pending court cases. But neither Vodafone nor Kane have responded to the government's overture yet. Are they waiting for a better deal? Kane Energy files for huge compensation claim. British oil major Kane Energy does not seem to be interested in a one-time settlement of its retrospective tax dispute. It has filed for compensation of $5.6 billion dollars from the Indian government for raising an unlawful tax demand against the company and not honouring the UK-India Bilateral Investment Treaty. The dispute escalated following the department's attachment of the company's shareholding in Cairn, India. And today, the interest component of the total tax demand is more than double the principal amount. Cairn's claim for compensation made in the International Arbitration Panel seeks to cover the loss in the value of its shareholding in Cairn, India and is equal to the tax demand. The Indian government will file its statement of defence against the compensation claim by November 2016 and hearing is expected to start in early 2017. The format of the tax scrutiny notice is revised. 
The Finance Ministry has revised the format of the Income Tax Department's notices to initiate the scrutiny process against an assessee. The new format, to be used across the country with immediate effect, will categorize the inquiry as limited, complete or manual. The new format also introduces the use of courteous language and phrases like for your kind information and you are invited to get the inquiry done in an e-enabled and paperless manner. Yes, CBDT's new pilot project will soon permit taxpayers in metros to opt for paperless scrutiny assessment. Can taxpayers now look forward to transparency and a paperless process? Can the public Wi-Fi model cut data costs? The telecom sector may be opened up for non-telecom companies too. To cut data costs and get faster Wi-Fi speeds, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India is keen to invite non-telecom companies too to set up public Wi-Fi hotspots. TRI has clarified that public Wi-Fi networks would refer to not just the Wi-Fi hotspots created by the licensed service providers at public places, but also other smaller entities who would like to participate in common and shared Wi-Fi network for larger public use. Consumer tariff for data may then reduce by as much as one-tenth in Wi-Fi compared to mobile data. The regulator has invited public views on a host of telecom issues by August 10th, including regulatory hurdles, licensing restrictions, business models, connectivity between Wi-Fi networks and de-licensing of mobile airways. Certificates of saving schemes are now digital. The government has digitalized the operation of its small saving schemes with effect from July 2016. It has discontinued the physical printing of National Saving Certificate and the Kisan Vikas Patra, which will now be available in e-mode and passport mode. In e-book, the certificate may be viewed online as a non-printable form while passport mode is the e-mode format printed or recorded manually in a passport. A customer may opt for either mode unless the infrastructure of the issuing branch restricts to any particular mode. But having chosen the exclusive e-mode, a customer cannot revert to passport mode. The government has advised the preference of the e-mode over the passport mode wherever possible. And on this note, we conclude this bulletin of the week that was. Thank you for watching. You may write to us at editor at tiol.in. Have a great weekend ahead.